Hi there. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pepe Carmel, and I have the pleasure of um, moderating this panel, uh, Museums and Collectors, a Fine Romance. We have three remarkable speakers this morning, Colin Bailey, Gary Tintero, and Tom Campbell. Let me just say a couple of words about each of them, and then we will get straight into it. Um, Colin Bailey is currently the director of the Morgan Library. He has been either director or chief curator at a whole series of museums. I think if there is an award for most museums, you may possibly win it. Uh, the Frick Collection, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, uh, the National Gallery of Canada, where we met almost 20 years ago. Uh, he's also known for an extraordinary series of exhibitions on Renoir and the 18th century, and I had the pleasure of seeing what I think was the first, the Renoir Portrait Show in Canada, and it was absolutely wonderful. Um, our second, well, actually, we're a little out of order here on the podium, but no harm done alphabetically. Our second uh, participant is Tom Campbell at, at the far end of the podium who is the director of a small museum you may have heard of, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And here I'd like to call out two amazing shows he did on tapestry, tapestry in the Renaissance and tapestry in the Baroque, uh, shows that really revolutionized at least my understanding of tapestry as an art form and reminded us, me, of why it was one of the great major art forms in its time, arguably more important than painting. So something, you know, really world-changing exhibitions here. And here in the middle is Gary Tintero, who was for three decades the curator, first of 19th and then 19th and 20th century art at the Metropolitan, before being called home to Houston uh, to become director of the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, again, a list of exhibitions far too long to go over. Um, I will just mention two. Most recently, the Lauder Collection show, and Gary played an absolutely cru crucial role in, in making that donation happen and in organizing the exhibition. Uh, and then more recently, this is typical, this is not even a highlight, but the Cezanne Card Players show um, at the Met, which again was one of those once-in-a-lifetime experiences. So, Okay, we're going to start by looking at two different uh, approaches to donating to museums. Uh, so I thought we'd start with the Robert, Robert Lehman, who was one of the great donors to the Met, but uh, Tom, I was thinking you could say a few words about the virtue of the donation and then the limitations or the restrictions that came with it. Sure. What we have to remember right at the outstart of this panel is that in contrast to the European museums, where most of the collections come from for former royal or government or ducal collections, the American collections are essentially a phenomenon of, late, of the late 19th and 20th century. Um, when the Met was formed in 1870, it didn't own a single work of art. And 146 years later, the reason that it is one of the largest encyclopedic museums in the world is uh, as a result of the generosity of generations of patrons who have built it up to this great entity. In order to achieve, to, to achieve that growth, um, we have all, all of the, the great American institutions, we're involved in this delicate dance with patrons because, of course, the patrons, um, however philanthropic they might be, they all uh, have their own motivations and agenda. Many of them have been passionate collectors in their own right, and they've spent a lifetime building up a collection. They feel very vested in the identity of that collection. And Lehman is no exception. He spent you know, 50 years building up one of the great collections of paintings, sculptures, glass, ceramics, textiles, and drawings, 750 old master drawings. And he wanted to keep it together. He wanted to recreate the experience of this great private collection in spaces that would evoke the character of his townhouse. Uh, the collection had been on loan to the Met, then it all went back to his townhouse. But when it came to the Met in 1969, it was on the proviso that we would create a standalone space for the collection that would, in part, recreate the character of that private residence. So it's a private collection within an institution. It's a one, any of you who have visited it will know it's a wonderful backwater. You go back there, you get away from the crowds, you're surrounded by the most extraordinary masterpieces. But the irony 
of this collection within a collection is that it has to stay together within the museum. Here is just one example of many. Here's the, um, uh, the, the Countess of, of Altamira, uh, who is a, a, a wonderful Goya portrait down in the Lehman Wing. Her son, Don Manuel, hangs upstairs in the European painting galleries. And every so often we can exhibit the pieces together, but uh, this is an ongoing friction. The 750 old master drawings are curated separately to the Met's world-famous collection of drawings and prints, which resides with another department. So with congenial interdepartment relationships, there is all sorts of collaboration possible. But it's the fundamental challenge that over the last 146 years, my predecessors and my curators have had to negotiate from one patron to another how much you allow a donor's intention and their desire to be enshrined forever in a gallery, in a suite of galleries, um, how much how you balance that with the broader educational mission of the institution, which is to show broad occurrence, movements, unaffected by the narrowness of particular collections. Underscore that point by saying that in 45 years of going to the Metropolitan, since I was a teenager, I never realized these two went together until a few days ago when Tom sent me these slides. <laughs> so, yes. So, I wanted to turn then to a more recent uh, donation that, as I said a minute ago, Gary was absolutely instrumental in the Lauder donation. And, and this is under very different terms. I was hoping you could say a few words about that. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. So Leonard, as I think many of you know, um, many of you know Leonard, um, Leonard collects in a very focused area. His, his brother Ronald is very Catholic tastes that range from medieval to contemporary. But Leonard, early on in his career, focused very narrowly on the, uh, the early formation of Cubism, and particularly collecting four artists, Picasso, Braque, Leger, and Gris, between about 1906 and 1920. He built up a collection of about 85 works, each of which is absolutely seminal. And it was clearly a, uh, a museum collection in the making. Every piece, top quality, perfectly provenanced, contributing to the story in a different way. Um, the collection was very much the subject of speculation and of gentle jostling among the leading institutions of the country. Uh, the conversation with him was started by Gary and by my predecessor, Philippe de Montebello. And to all of our delight, uh, Leonard made the decision in 2013 to make a promised gift of the collection to the Met. Um, we did a big exhibition of it in 2014 and 2015. It's now back at his apartment and eventually will come to the Met as a whole new foundation for the story of modernism that the Met presents. Uh, as many of you will also know, the Met, having collected contemporary art for the first 40 years of its existence, between 19, 1870 and 1910, it famously pulled back from collecting in the early 20th century because what was coming out of Europe, Cubism, Fauvism, was just too radical. So at one stroke, Leonard's promised gift fills that gap and really creates a new foundation for us to tell the story of modernism. Gary, um, I was wondering if you could say, tell us whether, if this isn't confidential, whether you had any struggle with Leonard about the more liberal terms and the possibility of showing paintings at different places in the museum. I've just invented this comparison on screen here between a Lauder picture and another picture already in the collection. Which would Tom knows, as I do well, there's no struggling with Leonard Lauder. <laughs> <laughs> it's, never, it's never a struggle, but it's always a delight. And, uh, you know, and, and I wasn't party to the very final discussions with with Leonard that took place after I left in, uh, in 2012. But it was always my understanding that his intention was to make specifically this kind of juxtaposition uh, to bring his works of art 
into dialogue with other works, including you know, the great portrait of Gertrude Stein that, uh, that Alice B. Toklas gave to the Metropolitan Museum, uh, and the Gel great Gelman uh, Brock, which is the cognate uh, to the Picasso in the Lauder collection. This was a time when the two were working in the same studio, didn't, famously didn't sign their paintings, and, uh, and there were a number of errors later in their lives when dealers would bring paintings for them to sign. Uh, often they could not recognize their, their, their own work from this very moment, as you know so well. It was, uh, I think, to Leonard's uh, credit, uh, he wanted his, he was very, very, like everything he does, he was extremely thoughtful, careful, did all of his research about what was going to happen to his collection. And this was not simply the case of this collection, but many other, you know, the, the uh, turn of the century American posters, which he gave 20 years ago to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, to his, um, is it a postcard collection that he gave to the, uh, to, yes. uh, to the, uh, yeah, to the MFA in Boston? Uh, and endowed a curatorship and made sure that, uh, that it was gonna be properly looked after. And that was certainly the case as, as, as Tom and many of you know uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He not only pledged his collection to the museum, but he also founded a study center so that uh, his work would, could, the, his life work, which is to create this in, uh, enormous assemblage, uh, would be continued by uh, successors, uh, and especially that there would be a scholarly component with publications as well. Wonderful, thank you. And so, it's, well, it's, it's an interesting, there's an interesting comparison here because Leonard's gift allows for the infusion of other works that are relevant to, to his collection, whereas the, the Gelman, uh, must the quest be must be restricted, yeah. has yes. to be shown alone. Alas. So here we're going to change, to pivot a little bit and look for, at a group of great donors, great givers uh, at various museums around the country. I'm going to rush past the first two images. These are the two men who essentially started the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, they took advantage of the War of 1870 to buy 170 paintings, many of which turned out to be fakes, of course. For $232,000, these are two of them that were not fakes and are still in the collection. I, I just want to underscore here, and then I'm going to turn things over to Colin, that they laid out the equivalent of $4 million in contemporary money in a gift to a museum that didn't exist yet. Pretty good. Anyway, Colin. Um, you, I believe, have some wonderful stories to tell us about the San Francisco museums. I just want to talk a little bit about the origins of the de Young and the Legion of Honor, which are the two uh, museums that comprise the fine arts museums of San Francisco. And we go back to the 1850s when Mikiel and Amelia de Young, Jewish uh, immigrants from Amsterdam who had established a dry goods factory and a jeweler's in Baltimore, bring their eight children to San Francisco. Mikiel Sr. dies en route, and Amelia and her eight young kids move into a poor part of San Francisco. Her two sons are Charles and Michael de Young, and they are uh, entrepreneurial, active. They create the newspaper of the city, the Daily Dramatic Chronicle, that employs Mark Twain, among other people. They, from very little, they establish a major uh, company, the newspaper, and the newspaper is much, much would remind us perhaps today of the New York Post. The editor of the rival paper writes, we have no hesitation in saying that the mean and malignant publisher of the Chronicle, Mr. 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 De Young, dis together with his disreputable editorial associates, ought to be publicly flogged through the principal seats of the city. Now, in 1879, the Chronicle engages in a um, campaign against the candidate for mayor, a man called uh, Reverend Isaac Smith Callock. And Mr. the Reverend Callock has been spreading terrible stories about the de Young family. The de Youngs have been writing about him as the sorrel stallion, such is his, uh, such is his adulterous record in Boston, which made him leave to come to San Francisco. Charles de Young, uh, fires at Callock after giving a speech in a church in Jesse Street. Callock survives and is made mayor of San Francisco the next month. <laughs> Charles is in prison waiting for his trial, having shot but not killed the mayor. And as the trial comes together, there is concern that the, a, a lot of 
dirty washing is going to be aired in public. The night, almost the night before the trial of Charles de Young takes place, the, the Reverend Callock's son, Isaac Milton Callock, on the left, on your left, the Reverend, the Reverend son shoots, goes into the Chronicle studio offices, takes a Smith & Wesson shotgun, fires five shots, kills Charles de Young in front of a, no, a large number of his employees. Trial is taken place, the trial begins in Judge Tui's gallery the, the next year. There are uh, a huge, huge uh, interest in the city. Isaac Callock is, gets off. He is released from uh, having, having attempted to kill, having killed Charles de Young, and is released because um, the Chronicle's journalism was, had, had, had uh, affected so, ma so badly affected his temperament. <laughs> Charles de Young now dead, his brother Michael de Young becomes the leading figure in Republican circles in the West, in San Francisco, the head of the Chronicle, the future uh, founder of the museum. In 1884, the de Youngs, the newspaper, takes on Klaus Spreckels, the sugar king, a colleague of Henry Havemeyer, who they, for three years, they have a launch a campaign against the shady uh, practices that Spreckels and his Hawaiian sugar company are engaging in in San Francisco. On the, um, on, on February, just get, I, get, I want to give you the exact dates here. In 1884, just after a um, stock meeting, the son of Klaus Spreckels, Adolf Spreckels, enters the Chronicle's offices at five o'clock in the afternoon and shoots Michael de Young. <laughs> he shoots Michael de Young. Michael de Young happily is carrying a number of Christmas books for his kids, and the shots are embedded in the books. <laughs> he is uh, not, he's not, he's, he's injured, he's wounded, He's not killed. He brings suit against Adolf Spreckels. Um, court takes place. He is uh, Michael de Young, who is now recovered. He's married to a Catholic pioneer family, a woman called Kathleen Dean, has a beginning to have a family. Michael de Young is called to the bar and um, asked to discuss, to, to make testimony about his, uh, the recent attack. The newspapers report every day, and they write, when stripped to the buff, Mr. de Young did not appear to be in first-class physical condition, his <laughs> tissues being so soft and flabby as to conceal any muscular development that he might possess. So not only when he was, when he was giving witness to his shooting, revealing his, um, his wounds, he suffered the indignity of this. After six months of trial, Adolf Spreckels, the, night, the day before the judgment comes, the, the argument in, in favor of Spreckels is that the yellow journalism of the, of the Chronicle had so distressed him and distracted him that he was without reason. Adolf Spreckels is let off. <laughs> he is, um, the New York Times re 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 reports that Mike DeYoung has been shot by a man who didn't like criticism and is, the man has been um, released. Fast forward 25 years, and Adolf Spreckels will marry in 1908 the very beautiful, very glamorous, and rather impecunious Alma de Bretterville Spreckels, who is the daughter of Danish immigrants, a most alluring and wonderful woman, who will found the Legion of Honor in 1924, which is the other museum in San Francisco's panoply. So for the de Youngs and the Spreckles have had to um, co coexist uncomfortably uh, until the mid-70s when these two institutions finally came together. That is the beginnings, unlike any other museum I can imagine, that is the beginnings of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. So. <laughs> they don't call it the Wild West. <laughs> exactly, it is definitely the Wild West. So now that the hatchet has been buried for a century or so, here are the current versions of the two museums, the de Young Memorial Museum. I don't think, I don't know if Michael de Young would have approved of this building. A new a museum that was uh, built, is ten, is, uh, celebrated its 10th ten, anniversary, Herzog und de Muren, a, a museum created in the, in, in the same site as the original de Young over enormous uh, conflict with the city of San Francisco, re money raised 
privately uh, in tooth by, uh, by Harry Parker and Diane Wilsey, and the museum celebrating its 10th anniversary last year. And then here's the decidedly more old-fashioned one from the uh, Mrs. Spreckles, the, fine, uh, the Legion of Honor, and just a quick glimpse. Oh, sorry, this uh, don't the Legion of Honor, which, as you by. know, was the setting for Vertigo, Hitchcock's Vertigo. And here is Kim Novak as Madeline sitting, looking at the portrait of Carlotta, happily not a work in the museum's collection, but in a sadly unpub untrafficked, unvisited Legion of Honor, uh, which is one of the most beautiful museums. In, in the country. Yes, and a quick glimpse of two works, one in each museum, and then I think we're going to stay out west, but not quite as far west, and Gary? The remarkable thing about Houston, Texas, is that so many of the philanthropists of cultural, well, I would say probably more than any city in our country, uh, our great philanthropic and cultural institutions were founded by women, and, uh, and that continues today. So. Uh, my museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, was founded in 1900 by a group of women, the Ladies Art League of Houston, Texas. It was then a small town, only 100,000 people uh, living there. Uh, they also had no art. They wanted to bring uh, art education into the public school district. They got uh, a quarter acre of land in 1914. They built their first building on it uh, in 1924. Their first work of art came, a painting by Jerome in 1917. Um, since then, you know, now Houston, the, the metropolitan area is almost uh, between five and six million people, depending on how large you count, but it's a size larger than New Jersey, almost as big as Massachusetts. It's a vast metropolitan area. Um, and our collections have been populated by, by women collector. Um, and most of my slides today have to do with them. One of them, Sarah Campbell Blaffer, and they all have to do also with the rise of, of uh, uh, the oil business in Houston. A spindle top, which is near Houston, Beaumont, Texas. Uh, they discovered oil in a salt dome in 1901. Uh, and many of our great families in Houston, the names that adorn the buildings and hospitals and universities have to do with spindle top. Um, so uh, Mr. Blaffer, for example, was one of the men, at, uh, one of the five families that owned the land at, uh, at, at Spindle Top. Campbell, she was Sarah Campbell before she was Sarah Campbell Blaffer. Campbell, so Blaffer became, uh, organized the Humble Oil Company, now called Exxon Mobil. Uh, Campbell organized the, along with a man named Cullinan, you'll hear about Cullinan in a second, uh, the company called Texaco. And so that was a very felicitous marriage when Campbell married uh, Blaffer. She was a collector. Wasn't that illegal? I think that kind of merger. <laughs> yeah. No, and then her daughter, uh, many of you may have known T.T. von Furstenberg, uh, who was the daughter of Sarah Campbell Blaffer, uh, and she married what was then the, uh, uh, one of the principal owners of, of Texaco, divorced him in the greatest divorce settlement that our country had seen, um, uh, and then uh, you know, famously renounced her American citizenship when she married an Austrian count. Uh, so that she wouldn't have to pay U.S. taxes. Uh, the IRS took her to court on the question of her citizenship, uh, and she won, just as she won in her divorce proceedings with her Texaco husband. And for many years, she was the richest woman in America. And that's Titi. Titi joined with uh, her, f she created a foundation uh, that joined with her mother's foundation, Sarah Campbell Blaffer. Sarah Campbell Blaffer gave that great Cezanne already in 1947. She wanted great pictures to come to her local museum, and she would select them herself. Canaletto, Bellotto, uh, Carl Van Loo, uh, sometimes esoteric masters, but always very fine paintings. Uh, her foundation joined that of her daughters. Her daughter brought great abstract expressionist paintings, uh, German expressionist paintings, uh, you know, Picasso, Matisse, extraordinary works of art, lots of uh, Francis Bacon. Um, and uh, after their death, it was her, you know, when she died, she wanted a foundation to perpetuate her interest in art and for there to be a kind of um, wandering exhibition of old master paintings that could go to every town and university in Texas. And it did for quite some time. Uh, finally, the foundation in the 70s reorganized herself itself after her death uh, to devote itself to creating a kind of Lehman-like old master collection of about 200 paintings, several hundred drawings. And, and that foundation, now she's out of the scene, both, both are out of the scene. Um, and the foundation executives uh, decide to create a museum 
in Sarah Campbell Blaffer's honor to fulfill her wishes, populated with these old master paintings that were bought on the international market in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, they bought land. They were about to hire an architect in Houston. And uh, at the last minute decided it would be better to go with uh, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And so they have dedicated galleries in, the, um, in our Beck building, more about Beck in, in, in a moment. And so there are five galleries with the Beck collection and they're integrated. Uh, unlike the segregation of the Lehman collection, these are better integrated in the tour of old master galleries at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, much as the Annenberg collection sits within the 19th century European painting galleries. Uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So that has been a happy relationship and we've just negotiated a new lease. They're gonna be there till 2064. Uh, and so we pay the overhead, obviously, the, and our visitors enjoy the privilege of looking at these uh, paintings. And it's a semi-autonomous institution, all coming from Sarah Campbell Blaffer, one of our many remarkable women. Another remarkable woman, also Texaco, Nina Cullinan. Um, on the right, uh, she gave, she invited, her husband um, was an architect a modernist architect who taught at Rice University, which has a great architecture school. And they invited Mies van der Rohe, whom you see in the, in the slide there, talking to James Johnson Sweeney, my predecessor as, as, as director at the Eastern Museum, in the great Cullinan Hall, which she conceived uh, and paid for uh, with her uh, Texaco stock. And uh, it was a great modernist building, and it's still there, survives. That's what it looked like when I was growing up in Houston. Uh, it was then extended through the generosity of the Brown Foundation, uh, and Alice Platt Brown, who has endowed the, uh, the directorship at the Whitney Museum, and great philanthropist, again, another woman, uh, made a great extension that Philippe de Montebello built while he was director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, now called the Brown Pavilion, also designed by Mies van der Rohe. Audrey Beck. Well, so thank Audrey Beck. This photo survived. I love this photo. Yeah. So that's Audrey uh, Jones Beck, and the, the important name there is Jones. And so you see her grandparents, uh, completely forgotten outside of Houston, Texas, uh, is Jesse Jones. Jesse Jones ran the TARP program of his day for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, worked with Roosevelt in Washington for 15 years and ran the Federal Reconstruction Agency. So all those dams, all those railroads, all those huge public work infrastructure projects that were uh, the hallmark of Roosevelt's uh, uh, plan to get America out of its depression uh, were run by Jesse H. Jones. And she was a granddaughter of Mary um, but was essentially raised by her, her grandparents. And so she grew up in New York and. Uh, in Washington, although always uh, kept a house in Houston in, in her adult years. But she sort of saw the world through her, um, her grandparents' eyes and had an institutional sensibility. Uh, and so that was really what she picked up from her parents. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, she created a great collection of uh, Impressionist and early modern paintings. Again, the institutional aspect, which is Jones Hall. So she uh, caused and willed into being uh, in the 1960s what was our Lincoln Center in Houston, Texas. It, it held the symphony, opera, and ballet. Uh, it's, it's now the home of the symphony, a, a very handsome building called Il Ro uh, Roland Scott, um, and still one of our prime venues. The land on which it was built was obtained by her grandfather, Jesse Jones, along with some businessmen who bought up uh, the land that is now the Civic Center in Houston and gave it with deed restrictions to the city saying it could only be used for cultural purposes. Uh, and that remains true today, and same is true of the medical center, which can only be used for healing purposes. Yeah, and there's the Beck Building. So that was uh, Peter Marzio, my predecessor, built this building with many donors in Houston, uh, designed by Rafael Moneo, and it houses the Blaffer Collection, the Beck Collection, uh, which we have here, marvelous paintings bought in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when you could buy great masterpieces for a lot of money, but still there was much more available in the market, Kayabat, Cezanne, Van Gogh. This great portrait that is identified with Audrey Beck of, uh, of Henri Matisse, and she oh. used to wear a purple uh, uh, Ottoman robe and receive you in her home. As I was a teenager and was invited to her house, and, and I'll always associate her with, it, with that marvelous painting. But just to show you how, um, how strong-willed these women were and how they created institutions. Great, thank you. So here we're going to pivot again and look at a, a key figure in the history of collecting in museums, J.P. Morgan. 
And um, I thought maybe Colin, you could start off and then Tom pick up the story with the Met after that. So uh, Colin, you gave me this wonderful Ooh. image. Well, the, the most, <laughs> the most, he, John Pierpont Morgan is the most patrician of all of our, uh, our Robert Barron Gilded Age founding collectors, museum uh, founders. He was the son of Junius Morgan, a, a, a very well-established banker, um, opening Morgan Bank in London. He was the grandson of a founder of Yale University. And he was educated uh, really like an English uh, duke. He, was, he learned French and German. He spoke those languages fluently. He um, entered the family business in New York early. He had an early tragedy in his life, falling in love with a, a young woman, Mimi Sturgis, whom he married, took to, on, on honeymoon to, uh, to France, and who, she died on, on the ship, practically. And this loss, uh, always was the, was the cloud was the r largest cloud in this young man's life. He married two years later Frances Tracy, a, a, a daughter of a lawyer, who um, a formidable woman who had very little interest in collecting or in art and was um, very tolerant of her husband's roving eye and enormous energy and desi desire to be in Europe half the year. So Morgan is a businessman who is involved in every aspect of his company. After his father's death, as often happens in the history of collecting, after the death of, of a very wealthy parent and the influx of capital and perhaps the absence of control, you, you find Morgan buying at a level uh, really quite unlike his previous interest in, in collecting books, his bibliography. He begins to collect particularly in medieval and Byzantine art. He collects decorative arts. He collects uh, superb uh, illuminated manuscripts from the Renaissance and the me medieval and Renaissance period, and he, be and he collects also work drawings. Uh, what, where you associate Morgan today, uh, the Morgan Library picks up a telephone in 1902 and speaks to, to McKim, Charles Follen McKim, and asks him to create a small gallery for my books. This um, superb building that is uh, the heart of the Morgan Library was never lived in by Morgan. It was his, li literally was his library and his study. He crossed from his house on Madison and 36th into the, um, this, this jewel-like uh, uh, building. He hired the f his librarian, Belle de Costa Green, the first African-American Princeton-trained uh, museum director and librarian who passed as colored, uh, as, as was, was noted, in her lifetime. Only very recently did Jean Strauss identify this, this remarkable, formidable, uh, gl very glamorous head of the Morgan Library. I may be a librarian, she wrote, but I don't need to dress like a librarian. <laughs> and she stayed at the Ritz and, draw, and, and was draped in Chanel and had an affair with Bernard Berenson for a long time. And she was a formidable director of the Morgan Library. And if we go just to see the, the space, the Morgan's extraordinary, uh, 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 the heaven for bibliophiles, the New York Times wrote in 1908. This building was opened in 1906. Morgan was not without a certain amount of wit. He commissioned, he shows um, uh, Van den Elst's uh, uh, allegory of, 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 of envy uh, above, his, um, above his fireplace to remind you about um, my, Midas, the, the dangers that might at, uh, attach to a, a new Midas. But this, this splendid compound um, restored beautifully, actually, interior, the interior is restored beautifully in, it, by, by under William Griswold in 2010, is the heart and soul of the Morgan Library. And it was here that the books, manuscripts, illuminated manuscripts particularly were left. But Morgan left most of his collection um, to the Met and to the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And, and as I'll say later on, to the Frick, in a, in a, in a way. Okay, so Tom, I thought maybe you could pick up the story at this point. Morgan sure. dies in 1913 while in Egypt, and then it's his son, Jack, who you see on the right, who's charged with disposing of these yeah. amazing collections. I'd say, you know, I think Gary was talking about patrons uh, operating the second half of the, through the 20th century, when in a sense the rule book was already getting established in terms of the relationships between generous donors and curators and civic institutions. And Morgan is kind of before that, when it's still pretty wild. And it's almost a kind of a, a morality tale. I mean, this man of gargantuan tastes 
who was the president of the museum, very philanthropic, very supportive. You know, he got us going in excavations in Egypt. But as he was building up this enormous collection of more than 7,000 objects, he never actually made a formal commitment to the museum. Um, he was frequently in a competition with our curators. He was furious with Roger Fry when Roger Fry bought uh, Renoir's Madame Charpentier. Fry almost lost his job. Um, Fry was equally furious with Morgan when he had reserved a Fra Angelico at a London dealer that Morgan bought, then went and bought for himself. So it was pretty messy. And the biggest mess was over his estate. Morgan <clears throat> had stored his art in London in, there was, at the V&A. And there were huge tax implications for him to bring it back to America. And finally, through political pressure, uh, the federal government changed the tax laws so you could bring objects back that were older than 100 years without having to pay a 20% tax, import tax on them. So Morgan finally created up his art to bring it back to the States. 351 cases of art. But he wouldn't let them be opened because the brinkmanship he was then playing was with the city of New York, that he wasn't going to give his art to New York and to the Met unless New York agreed to pay for a new wing. And he died before that was resolved. So it was left to his son to disperse the estate. And because Morgan had spent so much on art, in fact, he didn't have cash to pay off the tax that was due on the estate. So significant parts of the collection were dispersed, including, to my regret, all the tapestries, um, before his son Jack was able to gift about 7,000 works to the Met. So it is, it is perhaps the foundational gift. When, when the trustees started the Met, they thought we could never get old masters. We can, can never get sufficient quantities of real art, which is why they first collected plaster casts and brass rubbings. And Morgan really was a total game changer. But it was, a, it was not a straightforward process. Well, here are two of the objects that did land back at the Met. Um, so you can see the range of the collecting here from the medieval on your left to the, the high renaissance, the, the Raphael masterpiece on the right column. And uh, well, just Mrs. Morgan said of the reliquary, well, she said Morgan would buy anything from a pyramid to the Magdalene's tooth. And in fact, <laughs> in that <laughs> reliquary <laughs> is the Magdalene's tooth, if you believe that. Yes, yes, absolutely. But then there's the problem of the ones that got away. This was sold by the Morgan estate, by Jack Morgan to Joseph Duveen, and it seemed as if it might have been lost to the museum world, but there was a happy ending to this story, which I think, Colin, you can pick up again here. We're going to look at, now at the phenomenon of the collection as a work of art, the idea that we already heard about in the Lehman collection of keeping it together in the Blaffer collection. Uh, so let's start with the Frick. And, and this is an interesting, um, in a way, it dovetails into so much that we're talking about because Frick, of course, was also on the board at the Metropolitan Museum. Frick, born in the same year as Michael de Young, 1849, from a very modest um, family, a uh, family that uh, finally made it, he made it, it fortune, as you, as you probably all know, through the coke that was used for creating st steel with Carnegie and between Frick and Carnegie, these were the titans of the Industrial Revolution. Frick began to collect rather unimpressive contemporary art, salon art, genre paintings from Europe until uh, he too leaves Pittsburgh and retires to New York and becomes completely focused on collecting the finest group of old master paintings above all uh, and some 19th century works and creating this house on 70th Street that he does not inform his architect, will one day be planned as a museum. But it is a house that he wished to be kept simple in, in every possible way with plenty of light and air, um, not, nothing too uh, elaborate. He, those were his, those were his requ requests. And compared to the, 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 the palaces, the Thermopylae of bad taste that were lived in by the Vanderbilts, and the, this was actually a rather restrained uh, residence. But it was here that he created and his collections. He left in his will of 1915 the disposition that they were for the city of New York 
for the, and for the use and enjoyment of all or whatso whomsoever. And because of the debacle after Morgan's death and the need to raise the funds for uh, money for tax and the and the and the and the very thoughtful work done by Jack Morgan, Belle de Costa Green, and the Duveen family, Morgan was able to create. A Morgan was the Morgan collection lives on at the Frick in the Fragonard Room, in the masterpieces of 18th century French decorative arts, in superb collections of Renaissance bronzes, Limoges enamels, and Chinese porcelains. And these group, several groups of works were, were purchased one after another while Frick was building his rebuilding his house, or finishing his house on Fifth Avenue. And these works, which are part of the foundational collection of the Frick, and do not travel, just as the Frick works that Frick acquired do not travel. The collection since then has grown by more than 30%. Hundreds of objects have entered the collection. There was, no dis there was no desire on the part of Frick to stop this. In fact, Frick left $15 million in 1990. Uh, 19 for the ac for acquisitions, which made the Frick in the 20s the Getty of its day. Uh, so the, the misconception about the Frick that it is a sort of mausoleum, as the Berenson's rather nastily said, that it doesn't allow works to leave or that it doesn't grow, or it doesn't add collections, is as we all, as I'm sure everyone is aware now, is not true. But the Morgan collection that entered the Frick collection is really part part of the founding uh, works, and they are. Uh, as you can see, of the most extraordinary quality. Well, we, we still have a lot of territory to cover and not much time, so I'm just going to flash by these. But I do want to observe that one of the miraculous things about the Frick is that it contains such diverse work, which nonetheless somehow harmonizes. You wouldn't think Renoir and Vermeer, for instance, would fit together so beautifully, but they absolutely do. Um, now, for another collection that has a real meaning as a collection, Gary, you want... Well, yes, just quickly, Anna. I'm a hog again, one of these remarkable women in Houston, Texas, the, uh, the only daughter of a Texas governor who was a real estate speculator and uh, unbeknownst to him, there was a vast oil deposit under one of his purchases. Um, and so he became, and the family became very wealthy in the, in the early 20th century. Um, she grew up in Austin, Texas, in the governor's mansion, was educated at a girl's school there, but then went to New York for school and uh, Germany. Um, spoke German fluently, was a great pianist, uh, was going to be a concert pianist, studied in Vienna. Uh, her mother died, then her father died. She suffered a tremendous depression uh, during the, the First World War. And when she came out of that depression, um, she consulted Sigmund Freud in Vienna. Uh, she uh, began collecting in the early 1920s. Uh, do we have her the house? Uh, and so uh, she created with uh, her two brothers, Will and Michael, a beautiful house, one of the largest houses in River Oaks. She and her brothers created River Oaks, which is the Beverly Hills of Houston, a very beautiful uh, suburb just to the west of downtown. And they made a parkway and a great public park. And she, they reserved the prime uh, parcel of land, 14 acres, for their, for their own house, uh, which uh, she furnished then with uh, quite fine American antiques, and she was vying against Henry Francis DuPont, Henry Ford, um, uh, very influenced by the opening of the American Wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, great, went to the Great Girl Scouts ex exhibition where American decorative arts was suddenly looked at with similar connoisseurship uh, to that the European decorative arts uh, had, uh, had enjoyed. So she created a collection of American paintings. You don't see you know, her her Copley here or uh, her Charles Wilson Pill, but they're very fine 18th and early 19th century American paintings, excellent uh, furniture. Uh, and b b by the time she was in her mid 60s, she decided to convert her house into a house museum, which she gave to the Museum of Fine Arts in 59 when she would have been almost 70 years old uh, and opened to the public in 65 and she died uh, in 75. Uh, she gave it with an endowment. Uh, she wanted it to be enjoyed publicly. And she had said throughout her life that since uh, her wealth came from the ground uh, of Texas, she felt that the, the wealth belonged to the state of Texas. And she founded many organizations, including the Houston Symphony, an orphanage, uh, several hospital wings, uh, and schools at the University of Texas. So her, she was constantly philanthropic and, again, an institution builder during a lifetime.
So um, while we're speaking of decorative arts, um, Tom, you would want to say a few words about Jane Reitzman and this amazing set of Well, <coughs> yeah, the, Met, the Met has had various patron saints, and Jane Reitzman has been one of the greatest. Uh, she and her husband, Charles, c collected um, especially uh, European art, especially French, especially French with royal provenance. And during the 1960s and early 1970s, um, helped us, essentially they created the French period rooms, um, which are absolute jewels in the crown of the Met. Um, and they've very much encouraged, uh, they've continued to purchase, Jane continued to purchase for these rooms, um, but has also allowed works from other collections to enter them. So they've become these wonderful, uh, sort, of, um, sort of very charismatic heart of our European collections. And Jane is um, the curator's dream because she, you know, the, the whole, the DNA of the American institutions is the relationship between the donors and the curators. And Jane has worked so closely with Gary, with Keith Christensen, with my predecessor, Philippe, going up, identifying holes, going after great masterpieces. We would be a much smaller institution if it hadn't been for her ongoing largesse. I hadn't actually realized until we started discussing this that the rooms were not simply their collection, but indeed are vessels for many different donors' acquisitions. I mean, the vast majority come from the Reitzmans, but yes, certainly. It's, 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 it's a miraculous thing. So we are almost out of time here, but I promised everyone at the aperitif that we, we would hear about Rene Magritte in Texas, and that brings us back to Dominique uh, Menil. Again, another institution builder, uh, and you know, building after building, uh, Dominique de Menil, born in, uh, earlier than you might think, in 1908, came to Houston when she was nearly 40 years old with her, her husband, and John de Menil. She was the daughter of, the, of uh, Marcel Schlumberger, who uh, created the electrical device that could detect oil deposits in ground. And so they uh, became a, a vast oil equipment uh, company. Uh, and with that wealth, began collecting, I think there's a portrait of her by Max Ernst, or there was once uh, when she was a young woman, when she was just married. That's not her on the left. Um, on the right. Well, it could be her on the right. She was a very shapely young woman. Uh, but she, uh, she collected works of art and she collected artists, and she had very strong relationships with Ernst and, and Magritte. This is the image I promised everybody on well, the left. Well, this is how we live in Texas. And, uh, we wear, you know, fur coats at the rodeo. And uh, that is uh, Dominique de Menil with uh, Rene Magritte. What a surrealist encounter, the chance encounter of an umbrella and a sewing machine on a dissecting table. At a, at a rodeo, yes, absolutely. At a rodeo uh, with Brokeback Mountain actors that, there on the left. Exactly. <laughs> because and, we are... And you see how, and but at one point, I just want to bring up, so, you know, it's so interesting how people live versus the institutions they create. You know, look at the Menil home. It is not the purest, minimalist mecca uh, that you would imagine it would be. Uh, there was Victorian furniture, there was Tibetan art, there was folk art and, and paintings by Magritte and furniture by Charles James, her dress designer. Fantastic. Um, so uh, she had enormous style, great confidence in her taste, and she would create these assemblages. And it was that confidence that shaped institutions, whether it was St. Thomas University, which was transformed by them, Rice University, which was almost engulfed by them, then the Menil Collection. They, they had a period of almost 20 years at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston where they were the leading collectors and trustees, but they couldn't in a sense, control that institution. So they went to St. Thomas, worked their magic there, went to Rice, and finally realized they need to have their own institution where unfettered they could do, they could create their vision. And John was already dead when, when, when um, Dominique hired uh, Renzo Piano to make what many would still regard as his finest museum building uh, in the country. Yes, and I'm sorry to say we're not going to have time for Q&A, but I, I want to close then on a, a topic we haven't explored, which is patronage and architecture. I mean, we've touched on it in terms of wings, but this building is not only an extraordinary building, 
but one with tremendous influence and many heirs to it in, in um, Piano's work and elsewhere. So for instance, Colin, I, I think, was this, did you commission this or this was before your time? We celebrated world? 10 years of this building in April. Um, so. It was Charles, Charlie Purse with Parker Gilbert who worked with Renzo Piano over about three years uh, after creating a program to, to make this a uh, wonderful addition to join the campuses but most importantly to provide the right spaces for the for art, uh, education, stewardship and conservation. So we have Renzo Piano with the Meniles in Houston, Renzo Piano with the Morgan in New York and then another museum in New York you may have heard about, <laughs> the new building at the Whitney also designed by Renzo Piano. So here I'd like to take the opportunity to salute our patron and, and donor. Donna, I hope you're somewhere. Thank you so much for everything you've done. And thank you, thank you Tom, Gary, Colin, thank you so much for this. <laughs>